Okay, and with that, let's get started. Okay, so who am I? Um, I'm the Senior Access and Stewardship Marketing Manager for Onyx. I've been at Onyx for almost a year now. I grew up in New Jersey, playing in the hills there and really falling in love with the outdoors, and then moved to the Mountain West where I lived for almost two decades in Colorado, and then about three years ago moved to Utah, which is where I am today. Um, I have a, a slew of a winding path of experiences teaching environmental education, guiding wilderness trips, managing marketing teams for various outdoor brands across the industry. Um, and I really, I'm a jack of all trades. I, I bike, I backpack, I hike, uh, I'm a, a beginner angler, lots of good things. So not that great at anything, but just really like being outside and excited to be with you all tonight. Awesome. Next. Thanks, Becky. Yeah. Kick it over to you, Bergen. I'm Bergen. I am a product manager on the Onyx product team. My team at Onyx works on our topo base map, which we will uh, dive into later in the session. Uh, we work across all three of the Onyx apps. So we support the off-road team, the hunt team, as well as the backcountry team. Uh, I've been at Onyx for a little over a year. I'm located in Colorado on the front range. And I really like your intro, Becky. Similar experience, jack of all trades, probably master of none. Um, so I'm actually looking forward to learning a lot from the other panelists on this, on this discussion later uh, or throughout the presentation I've done a couple of backpacking trips. I am preparing for one in two weeks in the Wind River Valley in Wyoming with a few other only women. So excited to uh, hear from the other panelists on how to prepare because I'm going to be taking notes as well. And then I'll be diving into an overview of the Onyx product here towards the end. Excited to see so many people on the call. I'm going to kick it over to Nicole. Hi, everybody. My name is Nicole. I am the founder at Women Who Hike. I am calling in from the Eugene, Oregon area, which is also the ancestral homelands of the Kalapuya people. Uh, like a lot of the other ladies on here, I have also kind of become a jack of all trades. Hiking is definitely my first love. Of course, uh, love getting in those longer trips and going backpacking. I also mountain bike. I just got... Um, done doing my first season of backcountry skiing. Um, yeah, super happy that you all are here, excited to be hosting alongside She Jumps. I've been a huge fan of their programming for women and girls. And yeah, excited to see also what you guys all do with what you learn here today. Hi everybody, my name is Annie Lindhart. I am here tonight as the She Jumps representative. Uh, I am a, an event coordinator from the state of Michigan. Um, so I live in Northwest Lower Michigan um, in the Mitten State and I currently serve as the assistant director slash education director for a nonprofit outdoor recreation and education center. I've been working in the outdoor industry for quite some time now. Um, the bulk of my experience in the outdoor industry has been in instruction. Um, so one of my passions is taking people outside and teaching them how to thrive there, um, as well as teaching people how to take people outside. Um, so I'm super excited to be here with you all and I'm really thrilled to be on a panel of um, all women with similar experiences and excited to see what questions we can answer and how many of you all we might run into onto the trail. Awesome. Thanks, ladies. Uh, yeah, what a what a powerhouse crew tonight. Really excited that we're all here together. So thanks so much in advance for taking the time to be with us tonight. Before we get into the great content we have for you today, it, um, we, we wanted to share a awesome deal that we have going on for a quick window of time, 30% off the Onyx Backcountry app. The full price is $29.99. Um, so you can do the math. 30% off there is about 20 bucks. Um, this, this is the best deal that, this is the best deal that we ever offer for Onyx Country. So the time is now, um, to get into that, you can scan the QR code or the link is in the chat. Um, or if you're not quite ready to purchase, you could also sign up tonight for an extended one month trial so that you can take the app out for a spin, take it on some trips and hikes, um, and, and really build your, your confidence in all of the amazing features that it has. 
um, and then purchase later on um, when you're ready. So if you are ready, 30% off, heck of a deal, only valid um, until 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, so don't delay. Okay, what's on the docket for tonight? We have a, a, a lot of great topics to cover, finding a community, tips for planning, choosing a destination, how to mentally and physically prepare. Um, then we'll go through some gear stuff like the 10 essentials, um, then get into a deep dive demo of the Backcountry app from Bergen. And lastly, round out the night with the giveaway and some additional Q&A uh, with whatever time we have left. Also to note, there is so much to talk about backpacking, much more than we could ever fit in a one hour masterclass, but hopefully this gives you some learning takeaways and really inspires you to dig in to the resources that we offer tonight. Um, there'll be a lot of those um, flying into the chat and then really empower you to, to get out there and learn as you go. So with that, let's dive in. So getting into backpacking can definitely be intimidating. Um, but I will say there are always a lot of other women and people out there like you who are just getting into it as well. You're definitely not alone. Um, and also there are many people out there that are maybe one step or 10 years or whatever ahead of you in their backpacking journey and are, they're willing to mentor you, um, guide you, go with you. And this is really where community offerings can shine. So that's why we wanted to pull in Women Who Hike and She Jumps tonight into this masterclass. And I'd love to turn it over to Nicole first. And then, um, and, and then uh, yeah, and then Annie and we'll get, we'll really learn a little bit more about um, each of these groups. So Nicole, over to you. Yeah, so we started our Facebook groups in 2015, 2016. There's one for every state. Um, they are little miniature communities within themselves, and on any given day, there is women coming in there asking about where to go hiking, where they live, whether it's a day hike or wanting to get some advice about backpacking. There's women looking for hiking and backpacking partners. There is usually always real-time trail information as well. Um, conditions are always changing in the backcountry, especially this time of year as we're accessing places that are further and higher up. So our groups have just really been kind of a, I mean, honestly, like a godsend for people who are first time hikers, first time backpackers, wanting to, you know, hike peaks, um, even through hiking, <laughs> we've gotten to connect with and mentor and follow along with women who hike um, through hikers and you know, numerous group hikes. And obviously we've connected with She Jumps over the years. They have a lot of great events as well, whether they're like online or in person. And I think Annie can also kind of take the baton and speak to those as well. Sure. So She Jumps, we work really hard to increase the participation of women and girls in outdoor activities. Um, so a lot of what we do are free and low cost events because we recognize that money is oftentimes a barrier into um, getting into outdoor recreation and education. And a lot of what we do is truly all over the map in regards to experience, time commitment, um, things of that nature. So you could show up and never have done something before to an event, or we, um, every year we do a fundraiser where we send a group to um, summit a peak um, as part of what we do as She Jumps. So we have chapters all across the country, as you can see from that map there. And we're constantly putting on events in person and online, like Nicole mentioned. Um, so loads of different ways to get involved. We are a primarily volunteer-based organization. So most of the events that you see put on were organized and promoted by volunteers. Um, so it's a wonderful organization to get involved with. Um, and it's a pretty magical thing, um, spending time outside with a group of women. Um, it's really hard to recreate that feeling. So looking forward to maybe seeing some of you all uh, in some of these groups. That's awesome. Uh, there's a lot of she jumps and women who hike love going on in the chat. So uh, that's super fun to see. And also I'm not surprised because these two organizations are amazing. Yeah, we also got to summit Mount Hood together uh, in the month of June. We actually ended up having two trips, one summit and one non-summit. And it's just really awesome to bring our communities together. 
That's so great. I love it. Okay, let's dive into some tips for planning. We could talk about various tips and tricks of backpacking all day. Um, and truly there are so many, it depends, situations out there, which is not always the best thing to hear. But as a general rule of thumb, when you're um, starting to plan a backpacking trip or learning about backpacking in general, uh, this is a little list of considerations to think about when you start to plan that trip. So Annie, can you please take us through these tips? Absolutely. So this can feel incredibly overwhelming. This is just a very basic introduction as to some general things to think about. So first and foremost, consult the experience. Notice that we're not saying consult the experts. Um, the experience can be anything from hopping on Google and finding a blog, um, just searching what trail you're considering hiking. It can be walking into your local gear shop and asking around about some great trails for a beginner to hike. It can be something like going to your local climbing gym and talking to someone there. So just ask around, um, see what other experiences other people have had, because you don't have to be the best at something in order to know a thing or two about it, right? So the next thing you wanna figure out is what type of route you're going to take. Um, that matters because if you're planning a route that's an A to B route and you park at A and you don't have a way to get from B back to A, that can be a little bit problematic. So you wanna be mindful of the trail system that you're on and whether or not you need to work a shuttle or if you're gonna do a lollipop, which is where you hike in, do a loop and hike back out. Um, or if you're going to go straight in and straight back out. So those are some things to consider is you have to get to the trailhead, do your hike, and then somehow get back out from the end of your hike, right? You also want to be mindful of elevation changes. Elevation not only adds energy to your hike, but it also adds time to your hike. So there are different equations that you can use to technically map out um, and actually time, the amount of time that elevation gained and elevation lost add to your hike. Um, but those things do matter and going downhill takes longer than going flat. You would think it would speed you up, but that's not the case. Water sources are another consideration that you wanna be really mindful of. So as you're planning and looking at your map, you wanna pay attention to where you're hiking and where you're gonna be camping because you never wanna be far from a water source. Or if you are going to be far from a water source, you need to be able to plan for it. So always be mindful of where your water sources are. Be mindful of who you're going with um, because you wanna be sure that you're on the same page. If you're going out to relax and restore, but someone else is going out and wants to beat a personal record, on um, how quickly they hiked that trail the last time they were out. That's not a really good match in goal setting. Um, and you wanna make sure that you're kind of on the same page as far as your endurance levels and what you're wanting and willing to do together. Um, so those are some things to consider as well. As far as weather goes, I personally like to always check at least three different weather sources before I go out places, just because they can vary so much. Um, and so that's another really good way to tell what exactly you're going to be in for. I still pack as though everything is going to happen in regards to weather, um, but check three different weather sources if you can. And then always test your gear before you go out. It can be as simple as setting up your tent inside in your bedroom or actually trying to spend a night out in your backyard. Um, but you always want to make sure that the stuff you have works the way it should or works the way that you think it should, or that it came with all of the right parts. Um, you don't wanna get out there with a tent and not have your tent poles, right? Right, and I really appreciate adding that last consideration there because I oftentimes don't test my gear. So a really good reminder yeah. for me as well. <laughs> yep. um, awesome, thanks Annie. Let's move into yeah choosing the destination. Um, once you have a better understanding of the basics that we just went through, like what type of route, how far you wanna go, how much elevation gain, all of that good stuff. Um, next is the fun part, is choosing where to go. And of all the places to go out there, there is end endless possibilities. Uh, this can be a really, really fun process. It can also be a lengthy process, an overwhelming process, but again, like a world of opportunity, right? There's a lot of places to go. Maybe you're going in your backyard. Maybe you're 
driving 400 miles to go. I mean, there's just so many options. So um, kind of where do you start from this? Let's dive into a few uh, planning tactics here. I'm going to turn it back over to Annie to um, tell us how she might go about honing in on a destination. Yeah, again, you want to figure out what your goal is. Why do you want to go on this trip? Are you specifically going on this trip because you want to see a certain thing that's out on that trail? Is there a phenomenal waterfall that you've just been dying to check out? Or are you going out with your two best friends and you only have three days to go check something out? So you want to figure out what your goal is for this trip. And then you need to figure out how long you have to spend taking this trip. So those two things are kind of going to be your primary limiting factors around the trail that you're going to hike. If, you, if your goal is to hike as far as you can, as fast as you can every day, and you have four days, you might be able to pull off something a little bit further. Um, and you might be able to pull off an out and back where you can kind of say, okay, we're going to hike as far in as we can for two days, and then we have to make it back out. Um, or if you have seven days and you're looking for something a little bit more, more restorative and relaxing, maybe you're going to plan a trip that would normally only take people about five days to hike, but you're going to plan a down day, like a zero mile day or two in the middle of it. Um, so figure out why you want to do the thing, um, figure out how long you have to do the thing, and then you can go from there. Um, or if you already know what trip or what trail you want to hike, then you can kind of reverse engineer it, right? If you know that you want to do a certain thing, then you can say, okay, I need five days to do this trail, um, things like that. You also need to determine what your skill level is, both in regards to your endurance level and your competency as far as the backcountry skills that you may need. Um, so you need to really be mindful of can I actually complete this mileage in the time allotted, as well as do I have the skill set that I need in order to be able to be self-sufficient out for this long? So those are some important things, I think, in picking the destination right off the bat. Once you've picked where it is you want to go, you need to really be mindful of what land you're on, whose land you're on specifically. And that matters because there are very different and very specific permitting systems that we have to use in order to utilize different public lands. Um, and even private lands sometimes require permitting systems, right? So most public lands, so national forest versus BLM land versus even state forest campgrounds, um, they will all have very different types of permitting systems. Some of them only require 24 hours notice, or you can show up and get a paper permit in person. Sometimes you have to do 60 days notice, um, things of that nature. So it, you really have to do some significant research beforehand. Um, and I do believe that there is a resource in Onyx that does talk a little bit about permits that we might be going into a little bit later. Um, and then another lovely feature that Onyx has if you're playing around in there is you can plan out your mileage from point A to point B to C to D to E, depending on how long you're going to be out. Um, it, and it can tell you approximately what your mileage looks like and what your elevation looks like. And then you can calculate how long that might take you to hike it. Awesome. Such great tips. And um, not only do you want to know whose land you're on as far as the, the, the public land rules and regulations, but I also saw that Nicole dropped in the chat the Native Land website, which is an incredible resource too. So you can really dive into the indigenous history of the area, know whose ind indigenous lands you're on and empower yourself to learn more about the, the Native lands and history um, and honor those when you're out there as well. So Nicole, thanks so much for that add into the chat. Yeah, I also want to add to, um, and I, I think we'll probably get into this later, it's always a good idea to go into the ranger station before you enter the backcountry. No one knows the current conditions better in the backcountry than them, but if there is a cultural center nearby, definitely try to go visit one of those as well. You'll have a different lens for learning about the place that you're visiting, um, which I just always really love to do. 
Uh, it's like I said, ranger stations are really important. We don't have as many cultural centers in certain places, but definitely look to see if there is one where you're going nearby. Great tip, thank you so much. Okay, let's get into the preparations needed to mentally and physically be ready out there. You have the gear, you know where you're gonna go. Um, how do you mentally and physically prepare for a successful trip? Because we could all just off the couch wing it out there, but there's a lot of things that we can do to, to ensure better success. Uh, there, there can be scary things in the woods, um, how do you know your body will be ready for the route that you've signed yourself up for? Uh, there's a lot to this and, and mental and physical preparedness can really make or break a trip. So um, Annie, what are your tips for us uh, to prepare in these ways? First off, you got this. Um, everyone started somewhere. Everyone had the first backpacking trip at some point. Um, so take a breath. <laughs> You're gonna have a great time. Or if you don't, that's okay. Um, I've, I think everyone has had a backpacking trip that hasn't been the greatest, which is fine. Um, so I would say, again, really identifying what your goal for the trip is, is going to set the tone on the best way that you should both mentally and physically prepare for your trip. Um, so once you know what your goal is, you can tailor your prep to match. So if you are working to get out there to relax and restore, um, you may not necessarily need quite as much physical prep, but it might mean that you need to do a little bit more tying up of loose ends at home before you hit the trail. I know I have a really challenging time relaxing and cutting loose if I have a million things going on at home before I leave. So my prep might look a little bit different for a trip where I'm getting out and just trying to decompress. Um, if you're looking to hike as much as you can, as far as you can, um, then you're going to want to tailor your prep very differently for that, right? So I always like to tell folks to work your way up to it as much as you can. So really focus on doing smaller trips as much as is feasible. Um, they don't necessarily have to be overnight. If you can pull off some overnight trips, if you're planning like a seven day um, backpacking trip, if you can pull off some one and two night trips in the interim, great, go for it. If you can't, start going on walks as much as you can. Try to go on smaller local hikes as much as you can. Put some water bottles in your backpack whenever you have the opportunity to um, and start doing kind of some, um, some real life tangible workouts um, that are going to be realistic to the work that you're going to be doing on the trail. So personally, I find walking to be one of the best things to do, walking with a semi-weighted backpack um, is one of the best things that I prefer doing in order to prep for a hike. But in addition to that, there are so many YouTube videos and other excellent resources on how to train for hikes out there. So for sure, look into some of those great things. Additionally, I would say to also be mindful of um, your risk management plans before you hit the trail. So that can look different for different people. I always strongly recommend that folks take um, some kind of first aid class. I personally am a wilderness medicine instructor, um, so I might be a little bit biased, uh, but I do think that wilderness first aid and wilderness first responder courses are excellent um, for any of the backcountry trips that people might be taking. Um, if you can't take those, just having access to any type of resources, so books, YouTube videos, things like that, um, having an understanding of how to take care of yourself and anyone else that you might be out in the woods with is excellent. Additionally, telling people where you're going to be going is going to be hugely important. And then again, like I said earlier, another thing that I really like to make sure I do is I check my gear. Um, I practice redundancy wherever it's realistic. So I may not bring two headlamps, but I'll always bring a backup set of batteries. Um, I may not bring, um, a GPS device and a map and compass, but I will have my cell phone with Onyx downloaded and a map and compass in case my cell phone dies. Um, so practice redundancy whenever possible. And then I like to tie up my loose ends and do anything else that makes me feel good. Like leave a case of LaCroix in my car for when I get back to the trailhead. So that's how I mentally and physically prepare for a trip. Those are amazing tips. Um, I'm gonna steal steal some of those and make sure somehow my cooler still has ice in it for those LaCroix when I get back. That's um, good. 
Yeah, we have a, a question in the, in the chat that I think is a really awesome one. And that is, how do you determine what your skill level is? Um, and gosh, what a fascinating question with not a wonderful answer, because there's no like, you are level three at hiking, like that doesn't exist, right? So I would say, use data to help determine um, what type of terrain, length, mileage, you uh, think you're ready for. And the great thing about Onyx is it's a wonderful tool for multi-day um, adventures, but you can also just use it for that three mile hike and then that eight mile hike and measure your elevation gain and your mileage and your distance and your time, like use that data that's built right into to the app as you're tracking all of your different adventures um, and see where you fall. And you'll see your progress over time, especially if you do uh, your, you know, your same local trail over and over again to like, help assess your progress of fitness. Um, but ultimately, if, you, if you're crushing, say, a five mile hike with 2000 feet of eleva elevation gain, um, you, can probably, you can probably assume that you, you might be able to do that two days in a row, um, or maybe not quite yet. So anyway, use data, I guess, is my short answer there. And, and Onyx can really help you do that to not necessarily benchmark uh, your skill level against anyone else, but really against yourself and what data you're seeing within the app itself. Yeah, I'd also just like to add to to go out with your gear on if that is something that you're feeling a little bit reluctant about, like go for you know, the day hike that you usually do during the week with all of your gear on. Um, I also want to echo um, Annie's sentiment about having wilderness first aid. Uh, I remember when we had our ambassador team all sign up for it consistently, every person came back to me and was like, oh my God, I cannot believe that I did not do this sooner. It's especially important in the backcountry, And if you're not necessarily using it on yourself, you might be in a position where you might have to use it for somebody else. And those tools are just priceless. They're incredibly empowering and yeah, just cannot recommend that enough. Um, I know that there are quite a few wilderness first aid things that you can now take online. Those got like way more advanced during the pandemic. I think Annie, maybe you can speak to that a little bit, but highly recommend even just for day hikes and more so in the backcountry. Agreed. I highly, also highly recommend um, educating yourself in, in first aid in various ways, so. Also, I will add too, if you are attending those classes in person, it's also an amazing place to find your people. Like obviously everybody who's going there is has the same, you know, objectives that you do. And like, you never know, like you could find, you know, your hiking partner, or your backpacking partner in one of those courses. Great point, Nicole. Okay, let's dive into some, some gear stuff here. Gear, is an essential part of backpacking. Um, it's important to remember that nobody knows exactly what to buy at first. Um, backpacking is a fairly gear heavy endeavor, but you don't need to go super wild with buying stuff, all the lightest, all the best, all the most expensive. Um, you need to choose what is best for you and figure out how to, how to, how to get the, the gear in a way that doesn't break the bank or break your budget. Um, a lot of questions came up around this topic in the registration, so I wanted to address it. And everyone's different. Everyone has a different budget that they can spend, but a few ideas here. You don't have to buy everything right away. There's a lot of times you can borrow things from friends, family members. Um, there's also a lot of outdoor, outdoor shops that offer rentals for backpacking gear, especially for those items like, for example, a bear can that maybe you're going to use once a year and you don't want to spend the 80 bucks on it. Rent it. Um, I will say as like a tip for myself, if you are going to splurge on a few things, what I would recommend is this. I think having a good backpack is really key. It, it can definitely uh, make for a very uncomfortable experience if your pack is ill-fitting or if it's just not a great pack in general. So um, more on backpacks in a bit, but I think a good backpack is, a, is, is an essential also a good pair of hiking boots, hiking shoes, doesn't matter, it's personal preference, but make sure they fit you well, that they're not too small. Um, that's something I think is worth spending a little bit more extra money on to keep those feet healthy and comfortable and unblistered and so on on the trail. And then otherwise, something that I would recommend is getting a sleeping bag that you know packs down to be 
pretty small. Um, but sometimes what happens with people is they stuff their sleeping bag in and maybe it's not that great of one or um, it was a pass down or something and it takes up three quarters of your backpack and then you're like, well, shoot, where do I put the rest of my stuff? Um, it's a very common common uh, issue for people. So I would say if you can if you can splurge a little bit on a good sleeping bag that's built for backpacking that's really going to compress small um even it also recommend getting a compression stuff sack for it that can be another uh splurge worthy item i would say um otherwise do you need a titanium spork right out of the gate absolutely not so use your judgment of what you really want and what you what you don't um but those are a few tips and tricks of things that i would prioritize um, okay, let's go through the, the 10 essentials. Nicole, I'm going to kick this over to you to take us through um, a few nuts and bolts of what the 10 essentials are in your packing list. Cool. So obviously, first and foremost, navigation. Um, we're obviously going to go over a demo of Onyx here pretty soon. The reason that I love the Onyx app is because most of us have phones. Not everybody can go out and buy, you know, a $300, $400 Garmin device. And even if we do, um, sometimes those devices, unless you have spent a lot of time with them, like they're very difficult to use off of the bat. So I do have a Garmin mini that actually interfaces with my phone. So I am always overprepared when I go into the backcountry. So I have a paper map and I have a watch that also pulls maps. And I have Onyx and I have downloaded maps on my phone. So obviously, first and foremost, navigation, um, headlamp, anyone went over that a little bit, sun protection, obviously SPF, sunglasses, hat. Um, having the right hat when you're backpacking is very important. You want to be able to cover your neck also. That is a spot that sometimes is neglected and ends up getting a lot of sun. Uh, I have a Leatherman multi-tool. It is super, super small. Um, I actually do not do fires in the backcountry. Um, a lot of places too at certain elevations and a lot of places that we're accessing right now don't allow for them anyways, but as a rule, I just do not do them. Uh, shelter, bivier tent. Um, obviously that is up for you know, personal preference. I have never bivvied. I have friends who cowboy camp that swear by it, but I use a pretty small one person tent if it's just me. And it's kind of nice if you are going out with a couple people, you can split a two person tent. One, per one person can carry the fly in the actual tent. The other person can carry the poles, which is nice. Extra food, extra water, um, Extra clothes, very important that you know how to layer, especially if you're going back for, you know, multi-day adventures. Um, you kind of want to stay away from cotton. Merino is a pretty standard <laughs> um, thing that most of us all use. Uh, synthetics also work super well. You can buy synthetics, you know, pretty much anywhere and they're pretty affordable. Um, I saw someone else mention this in the chat too. You definitely don't ever want to go out backpacking in a like new pair of shoes or boots. Break the pair of shoes in that you're going out for multi-day adventures. And when it comes to a backpack, one of the best things that I think that I did and backpacks are getting way more and more advanced even just over the last five years. But I went into a store and got measured for a backpack. We all had different body types, different, you know, shaped torsos, um, different length of torsos. I'm very short, but I actually have a pretty long torso. So go into a store, get fitted. They'll probably recommend a couple of things for you. Um, I've been using Droider for many years. I think that their suspension system is second to none, but a Droider might not fit you as well as it fits me. So I would recommend going into a co-op or any outdoor store and get fitted for a backpack properly. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to touch on that point as well, Nicole. So thanks for, thanks for doing that. Um, and when you go get fitted, make sure you and, and the shop employee puts weight in the pack, then you'll really be able to feel it. Um, try on a few different ones, walk around the store. That's a super essential part of buying a pack, I would say. Um, 
Another question that we got during registration was how do I know what size of pack to get? And Nicole mentioned torso size, and that's that's a variable that you need to figure out for sure. And then also, like, how do I know what volume of pack size to get for my trip? And that depends on the trip. It depends on the season. But in general, if you are setting out to buy your first backpacking pack and you aren't really sure where to start, the general rule of thumb, I would say, is aim for something in the 50 to 70 liter uh, size range. Um, and that's a pretty big range too, but sometimes just having a little bit of a ballpark of like, what kind of, what size pack do I need for a, a three-nighter or even a week long, like a, somewhere in the 50 to 70 liter range is a great place to start. Um, Okay, a couple other backpack tips, because again, this is, this is a, we got a lot of questions about this and backpacks can be confusing in itself. Um, how the heck do you pack your pack? I'm gonna give you a crash course in how I like to pack my pack uh, so that it's, it's, it's um, essentially packed the best way that it can be so that, so that my body can carry it most efficiently. Um, what I would do first is put my sleeping bag in that compression compression sack, like I mentioned, into the very bottom section of your backpack. A lot of packs have like a little shelf in them. Put it below that shelf right in the very bottom because essentially what happens is you want the lightest stuff possible all the way at the bottom of your pack, which is sometimes counterintuitive for what people think. Um, but the reason for that is like that's the part that kind of hangs out like right over your butt. And you don't really want a lot of weight right over your butt because it, it kind of like can drag you down from your butt. So don't, don't do that. So light things in the very bottom and then right around my sleeping bag. I like to tuck my socks in those nooks and crannies, um, other kind of light and fluffy objects, pieces of clothing, whatever, so that that bottom section of your pack is packed really tightly, but with pretty light stuff. Then from the top of your pack, you're going to you're going to insert the heaviest things you have. Most likely that's your food. That might be a reservoir of water, um, all of those big heavy items. What you want is for them, hopefully you can see me, to sit right in the lumbar section of your back. So again, if you think about um, where they're going into your pack, that is, is, is um, right up against the small or the lumbar section of your pack, of your back. Reason for that is because that part of your body is really stable and really strong. It also um, keeps that center of gravity with all of that weight super close to your core, um, which will make your carrying load the best that it can possibly be. So your heaviest stuff in there next, um, leaned up as much as you can towards the, the back system part of the backpack. Um, then you pack the rest of it, um, kind of around that, right? That's your camp stove, um, other clothes, layers, stuff like that pack kind of in the outer part of the mid pack and then all the way up to the, to the top. Um, and then the brain of your pack, which is the very top part that of course you want to put things that you need during the day that you're not going to have to like yard sale your whole pack to get to your cliff bar. So put all of those like essentials that you need during the day into that very top brain. Um, a lot of packs have hip belt pockets and things like that that you can sort your, your, uh, your goodies as well. Um, but hopefully that helps as far as like what to put where in your, in your backpack as again, like a very quick crash course. Um, what else was I gonna say? Uh, I would like to add to, sorry, Becky, there's, yeah. there's definitely some backpacking specific stuff that isn't necessarily on this list. Um, you know, stuff like water filters, um, a shovel for going number two in the backcountry. And then when Becky mentioned like the top part, so I personally backpack in a 45 plus 10 and most backpacks have like an additional top area called the brain where you can like I add additional gear. So like my backpack technically is a 55 liter because I always have, you know, an extra 10 liters worth of room at the top. I rarely use it, but I would say that anything that you want to easily access while you're backpacking, which includes stuff like your water filter, first aid, any other kind of like bathroom items, keep those accessible so that you're not having to get to the bottom of, or like in the middle of your pack, because a lot of backpacks still don't have that front access. Um, 
yeah, I just want to pop in there while you're specifically talking about the brain of the pack and like what it does, what you can use it for and what should be in there. Yeah, those are yeah great, great additions. And every pack is different. There's usually a lot of pockets and things on a backpack. So figure out what works best for you as far as like where to put all your stuff. A lot of them have like a front stuff at pocket that I like to put my rain jacket in. Um, speaking of rain jacket, to Nicole's point, this is not an all-inclusive that I, I'm going backpacking gear list. This is like the classic 10 essentials. You could probably live in the wild list that you can find all over the internet. Um, so please do your homework beyond this to make sure you have um, a, a more inclusive, like complete list of, of what you want to get or what you want, what you need to bring. And then also one last tip is like, we, we got a lot of questions in registration of um, how do I keep my weight down? How do I like know when is a non-essential item to pack? Um, and I would say, find that list online, dial in what you really know you need, and then personalize that for the, the, the one or two things that you do feel like is a weight splurge for you, right? Maybe that's a watercolor set. Maybe that's a flask of whiskey. Maybe that's a really nice camp chair. Like all of those are great things to bring, but maybe you don't want to bring all of them. So I just, I just want to say like, there's no hard, fast rule of like, this is the exact list. And this is the only things that you can bring. Um, just be just standing, standing to your own on that. And like, if you really want that watercolor set, bring it, you know, it's like probably worth a half a pound to you. So. Okay. Um, I'm going to kick things over to Annie again. I just talked a lot to take us through the basics of uh, maps and compasses. We love Onyx and the, all of the benefits of the digital navigation that it can provide us, but actually understanding the basics of um, analog mapping, if you will, is a really critical foundation of being a safe outdoor adventurer because there's a there's a ton of skill sets here that really um, overlap and can build on each other. So Annie, go ahead and take it away here. Yes, so I think that navigation is probably one of the most um, charged technical skills that you will learn when it comes to spending time outside. It can feel one of, it feels like it's one of the most high stakes things. Um, and so I love trying to break this down and make it feel as easy as possible. Um, it's not always the easiest, but just know that um, if you're feeling a little bit intense uh, and like a little overwhelmed by navigation, that's okay. We've all been there. Um, I still feel there um, somewhat often, but it's just how it goes. So a lot of times when you're looking at maps, when it comes to doing anything in the backcountry, you're going to be working with what's called a topography map. Um, and a topography map is a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional figure. So imagine like um, rings in a bathtub. Oftentimes um, you'll kind of see a line where the water used to be and that water goes away. So imagine that you are flying overhead over top of a mountain and you're looking straight down and you are drawing lines every 30 feet down on that mountain. So every 30 feet, you measure 30 feet down, 30 feet down, you draw a line, down, draw a line. So again, it's a 2D representation of a 3D figure. So when it comes to reading a topography map, there are some things that you need to know. One of the first things that you need to look at is the key or the legend. Um, and so everybody's map might look a little bit different. I personally, um, I'm a sucker for old school. So I love the old school USGS topography maps. Um, this one is folded up nice for me. It's like twice as big as my torso when I open it up. Um, but there's loads of information in the borders of these maps that you need to know. Um, and if it's this, or if it's like one of the National Geographic yellow ones, that's like this big by this big, every map is going to have a key or a legend that's gonna have a wealth of information for you. It's gonna tell you what all of the different lines on the map mean. It's gonna tell you what the different colors mean. It's gonna tell you which direction is north. Sometimes up on a map is not north. And that's really important to know which direction on your map is north. Um, so first thing you should do is check out the key or the legend. 
to kind of orient yourself to the map that you're going to be using. After that, you can start to dive in a little bit more and check out the topography lines. So those lines give you a wealth of information as far as what the landscape is actually going to look like, look like in real life. Um, again, every map is going to be a little bit different. So the lines on the map, um, some people call them topo lines, some people call them contour lines. They kind of mean the same thing, um, but different maps are going to have different distances between the lines. Um, so it depends on your map. Um, the long and short of it is that the closer together these lines are, the steeper an area is and the farther apart they are the more flat it is and so that's important for you to know when you're looking at a map one so you're not walking up to the edge of a cliff and two so you're picking out the most realistic route for yourself um, as well as being just able to calculate the different elevation changes that you're going to be working with um, so it's a skill it's something that you should practice and work on um, but that's primarily what you need to know about maps is find that key or legend to get to know it and then pick out those topo lines and try to pick out some different areas that are steeper, more shallow. They're going to come to different um, intersections where there might be um, really sharp points that look like V's, really broad points that look like U's. You're going to see circles at the tops of things. If you ever see a circle, that means you're at the top of a point. Um, so topo lines, there are loads of phenomenal resources out there for you. Um, additionally, in the chat, once I'm all done talking with you all, I have three videos that I'm going to put in just because this is kind of a challenging skill to talk about um, without having close up shots. So I do have three videos that I'm going to put in the chat that tell you about some map basics, some compass basics, and then how to put the two together. Um, so know that those are coming. Next up, you've got your compass. So your compass is great for telling you which direction is which direction. Um, and the big thing with your compass is you want to figure out which direction is north. So um, on your compass, your compass has many different parts. The big ones that you want to know are your magnetic needle, which is the part that spins. And then you've got your housing, which is the part that you can twist independently. Um, and so that is how you are going to find north. Um, and then, like I said, I'm going to be posting a video in the chat that talks about how to orient your map. So the way that you orient your map is you are going to know which direction north is on your map. Again, it's not always the top of the map. Some are really tricky. Um, and then you're going to take your compass and you are going to find north in real life. And you're going to put those two things together. So that way, your map and real life match the map is an accurate representation of your surroundings, right? Like I said earlier, I think navigation is one of kind of the headier things that we have to learn when we're first getting into these things. So one of the things that I like to do with new folks who are learning how to navigate is really work with you all to build confidence in your skill set. So what are some tools that we can use other than a map and a compass to start feeling good about knowing where we are? Um, there are different things that you can look around for to have a general idea of knowing where you are. Just because you have the map oriented doesn't necessarily always mean that you know where you are on the map. And so when it comes to building confidence in your skills, these are some tips and tricks um, that I'm about to talk about with you all. So handrails. You all have walked up and down stairs before um, where you have had a railing to hold on to. So in the back country, a handrail is not too dissimilar. So if you've ever hiked alongside of a stream before, you've hiked along a handrail. If you've ever hiked alongside of a bluff, you've hiked along a handrail. So utilizing landmarks and features in the environment, such as creeks and streams that can be on your left or on your right, are excellent tools to use in real life to be able to recognize where you are. You can have a bluff on your left and then look at your phone, at your Onyx app or at your analog map and say, okay, I'm on the trail and on the map, there's a bluff on the left. Is there a bluff on the left in real life? 
Yes, there is. Okay, good. I think I know where I am. So another tool that you can use is something called a backstop. And a backstop is a feature that you can pick out on the map that says, okay, if I hit this, I've gone too far. Or um, it can be something like, okay, when I hit this, I need to take a right at the next trail junction. So it's kind of like when you are giving someone directions in real life and you're like, yeah, okay, well, if you hit the Arby's, you've gone too far, you need to, you need to turn around and go back. Um, a backstop is not at all dissimilar. So when you're hiking and you come up on a lake, it's like, oh, no, shouldn't have hit this lake. We should have taken a right at that last trail junction. So your backstops are places where you know you've gone too far or you know that you need to take a turn. Trail, junction, trail junctions are another great way to kind of build confidence in knowing where you are. Um, if you come across a trail junction um, in real life and you check on the map and there's supposed to be a trail junction there, great. Um, that's another great way to tell. And sometimes I will say maps aren't always updated. I think the map that I have on my desk was last updated in 1983. Uh, so there have been some new trails built since then and I'm sure some trails have disappeared since then. So take some of this with a little bit of a grain of salt, um, but I would feel confident that a creek or a giant bluff would not have disappeared, but a trail junction might be a little bit tricky. Um, additional features that you should be aware of is how to know that you're actually on a trail. Um, so look around for blazes or cut logs, um, cairns, rock cairns. So when people stack rocks, those can be intentional trail markers or those can also be tricky. Those could be social trail markers that someone has used to mark kind of an unofficial trail. Um, so take those with a grain of salt as well. But those are some excellent ways to build confidence in your newfound navigation skills is utilizing those features in order to be able to confidently look around and know where you are. Um, and then as just a personal challenge myself to you all, um, I always like to tell folks as you go out and start navigating, every once in a while pause and look around and find three things that you see in real life that you can then find on your map. And this can be a little bit tricky. You don't want it to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. You don't want to say, oh, well, that's probably that. And that's probably that. Um, but really challenge yourselves and look around and say, yes, okay, I have this bluff on my left. I have this creek on my right. And I have this trail junction in front of me. So every once in a while, just take a pause. Navigation is a skill um, that you're only going to keep getting better at if you keep pushing yourself. It's amazing, Annie. I had did not know the term handrails in the context of navigation. Yeah. So always learning, so cool. Um, just a, a quick one. time check before we turn it over to, to Bergen. Um, we're almost at time, but what Bergen's going to show you is incredible. Um, so we're going to give her about 15 minutes to go through this demo and then we'll wrap it up quite quickly um, with the giveaway. So don't, don't leave. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll get you out of here about, about 7.20 or so mountain time. So Bergen, over to you and thanks everyone for sitting tight. It's about to get really good. Awesome. I am going to try to bring some connection to the um, overview that Annie just provided and how you can leverage a lot of those same pieces of advice with our digital mapping tool within the Onyx, both web map and mobile experience. So I do just want to note that when you create an account, you'll have the ability to log in online, giving you a much bigger, or on your computer, assuming a laptop or, or desktop, you'll have a much bigger real estate to see um, what the map as a whole, which I use a bunch from a, a trip planning perspective. I'm obviously not going to carry my computer into the woods with me, but I like to do a lot of my trip planning on a bigger screen. And then what's great about the product is that whatever you're looking at on the web experience translates to your mobile experience. So in this case, you'll see a couple of pins here that I have on the map. This is content that I have created. I have added to the map. I'm a big forager, so I'm often looking for mushrooms, and I often pin my honey holes on the map with these what we call waypoints. So I'll start to zoom in and show you um, in a little bit more detail granularly uh, where I'm at now, and then assuming that you're planning a trip to a to the northern or in Oregon around Mount Hood, I would I'll walk you through how I would plan for that experience. So I am starting with our topo base map. 
we do have a couple of options from a base map perspective. So you won't see things like contour lines that Annie mentioned until you get really zoomed into the map, um, which I will show here in a second. But we have a couple of options from a base map perspective. So you might want to use the topo base map to plan for things like elevation. Is this a peak that I want to try to explore? Is this a valley that I'm going to have to hike out of? If I have to go down, um, how much elevation will I gain or lose? But another tool that I find really helpful within the Onyx product is the ability to look at both satellite and hybrid base maps. Satellite refers to aerial imagery. So as I start to zoom in here, I'm in Colorado and you'll see the map is updating with what is the photo of the ground. As I start to zoom in as well, you'll start to see these blue pins start to populate on the map. These are all Onyx trails that have been submitted by other hikers and curated. So we are showing our, our Onyx customers or users really the best, what we've deemed like great trails to go hike. Um, as I zoom in, more of these will show up. Um, it's very dense where I live here in Colorado, but as I start to zoom in, you'll see these blue pins on the map. And you'll also start to see, I'll switch back over here to Topo real quick, but you'll start to see these, this green shading show up over the base map. The green in our app represents public land um, and public land being areas that you can go out, you can most likely camp, you can either camp in the backcountry, you can camp in your tent, at your vehicle, et cetera. But you'll see wilderness areas as well as uh, national forest and BLM. BLM is gonna be uh, represented here as well. So all different types of public land that you're able to access um, is shaded here in green. So these are typically great areas to hone in on if you're looking for a backpacking trip, because you know it's gonna be a very vast area and there's going to likely be a pretty large trail network in that, in that area. As I said, the blue is really these curated routes and we'll look at a specific one here in a second, but I wanted to touch on a couple more things before we, we trip plan specifically in an area in Oregon. Um, this button here on the bottom right will also have this in mobile, but it'll show your current location, uh, which is always helpful as you're navigating to know where you are in relationship to the map. This will also work when you're offline, which is great. Your pin will show exactly where you are relative to the trail, or if you're foraging. In my case, I'm often off of a trail and I'm in, um, I'm just in the forest and I often need to know how to get back to my car. Um, so I need to know kind of where I am in relationship to the trail. You'll see here, as I started to zoom in, uh, you'll see more detail around those, those pins become the name of the actual trail. One of the things I really love about uh, both the web and the mobile experience is, and we talked about this as you're preparing for a backpacking trip, you might not have um, two days to go to go train. You might have a Saturday and you might want to look for a trail that is, I don't know, greater than three miles, but less than 10. So we have these filters here that you can start to use within the product. So really to curate what type of trail you're looking for, for the given period of time that you have. So anything between six and 30 miles might be my um, my, my filter here and things will start to re be removed from the map that actually match the filter that I have applied. Uh, we also have ratings on the trails that have been submitted by other users and people that have hiked in those areas. So we'll be able to quantify whether that's an easy trail, a moderate trail, strenuous or very strenuous. So these multi-day backpacking trips will likely fall under that strenuous label um, so you'll be able to kind of take all of those off the map and I might just want an easy trail. It's a, or a moderate trail. In this case, you'll see that, that high, I'm kind of moving my cursor over that, but that North table loop just showed up. You're able to click on the trail and get a lot more detail. And we're going to look specifically at a backpacking trip in the Mount Hood range here. So one more thing from a tooling perspective, um, is your content. And actually we'll go ahead and, and show that in the Mount Hood area. So you found your community of people and they are coordinating a trip around Mount Hood in a couple of weeks. So your first trip, you're overwhelmed. You want to learn more about the area. So the name of the trail is the Timberline Trail and that is around Mount Hood. So the search feature we have here, uh, you're able to look up trails, you're able to look up cities, 
you might want to plan a trip to whitefish and look for trails around whitefish. You could search for whitefish here and then start to explore that area. Or in this case, we know the specific trail that we're going to. So I'm going to look for the Timberline Trail. And this looks like our option over here in Oregon. So it's going to bring me over to that area. Awesome. When I so, uh, I, like I said, I searched for the Timberline Trail. There's going to end up, there's going to be a really detailed description here on the left hand side that includes a text overview, the total number of miles. So in this case, this will be a 40 mile loop. Um, so you're going to need a couple of days or a few days in order to achieve this. So you'll be able to kind of gear how much time you're going to need. It's, we have a time estimate. This is hiking time, so active time moving around 23 hours. So let's say you want to hike eight hours a day. That would be a three-day trip that you'd at a minimum want to plan for here. Uh, we have the elevation gain and the elevation loss. So over that 22 hours or 40 miles of hiking, you are going to go up to 7,000 feet and back down to 3,000 feet. But over the course of that 40 miles, you're going to see over 11,000 feet of elevation change. So that is something that you can start to think of. And from a planning perspective, as Annie mentioned, how much time you're going to need, you can start to gear how much you personally would need to plan for for this trail. One of the things I love about the web experience is I mentioned the low point of this trail is 3,300 and the high point is 73. As you see here, I'm, I'm moving my cursor over here on the left with the elevation gain and loss. And at every point along the trail, you'll be able to gear, gauge exactly what elevation you'll be at. This is super helpful for me to know if I'm planning to do, I don't know, in this 40 mile hike, 10 miles during the one day, how much, where will I be sleeping? Where will I be? Uh, how much elevation will I start at? Where do I plan to end at? So throughout the, as you see, as I move across kind of from the left to the right, it'll show elevation at that specific point. There's a bunch of other details here. I mentioned the description. This is something that a, a user submitted and we are, are, are surfacing that here. So it's going to be a really detailed description of what is on the ground and what you can expect when you get out into the field. So lots of granular information here for the Timberline Trail, which is super helpful from a planning perspective. Um, Last thing I'll touch on before I dive into the details on the map is some photos. I find photos to be really inspiring as I'm trip planning. I love to figure out a, a feature I'm looking for on the trail and the photos often help me navigate or yeah, I love water on a trail. I would be sold at photo number two. <laughs> so you can go through this and, and start to see what other users have submitted from their experience on the Timberline Trail, which is really helpful. I'm gonna exit out of that and I'm gonna to touch on, again, we talked about the topo map. This is the topo view. So you'll see the contour lines or the topo lines that Annie mentioned. And you can start to use this to gauge elevation and the, the pitch of that or the steepness of this area. At the top of the circle here would be the, the peak of Mount Hood and those circles start to surround that. So our topo base map includes, oh, I have all my filters on. Let me reset those so the trail shows back up. Um, You'll start to see as you zoom in other details on the topo base map, like uh, the road network to get there. There are things like the rec points here. Those are those brown squares. Um, there's things like campgrounds, trailheads. Is there a restroom in the area? That's always super helpful to know. Parking icons will often show up here as well. The rec points are really to help you uh, from, a, from a planning perspective. Where am I gonna park? Where am I going to camp the night before? Where am I going to camp sometimes on the trail? Um, and all of that information is super helpful and displayed as rec points. I mentioned I use the waypoints a bunch for my foraging spots. In this case, if I was planning a trip to the Timberline Ridge, I would start to document on the map things like, where am I going to camp the night before I go out on a trip? Where am I going to park my car for three days? In this case, for the Timberline Trail, this is a loop. And when I click on the trail there, you'll see that this is a loop. So I would plan to park my car um, at this start and end point, which is this green circle here at the bottom that has a green and red, red shading. 
that indicates that this is the start and the end point for this trail, which is great for me. I know I need to park in this area and then I can plan my trip from here. Examples of other waypoints that I typically would put on the map if I'm planning a trip like this would be water sources. Crit critical to know where you're going to have access to water. And so as I start to zoom in on the map and I'm, I'm looking at this trail and trying to figure out um, where I might have access to water, the topo base map includes these water sources like you'll see here. Um, I've also added a waypoint that for like where I would be able to view this beautiful waterfall. That's what I've indicated here. In order to add a waypoint to the map, um, you can either click directly on your screen and add a waypoint, which is here, or on the right-hand side, we have our tools menu and you can access waypoints through there as well. Um, waypoints are great because in the event that you are trip planning with a group um, and not going alone, you are able to start to create a collection of your content. So I've added a bunch of waypoints here on the map. If I go over here on the left to my content, I mentioned I have a bunch of these waypoints. If I click here, I will see a list of my waypoints that I've created. I can also add photos to waypoints, which is super cool. In this case, I might be interested in this Tilly Jane campground for one of the nights on my trip. I found this photo. This is what I would be looking for as I'm on the trail. So I, I have something that I can orient to once I'm out there, which is really helpful. But one of the things I wanna to touch on is sharing of waypoints. So you're planning this trip with other individuals. You don't wanna, uh, you wanna talk about where you're gonna park, talk about where you might camp. What you're able to do is, first of all, you can add these to a folder. So I've created my Timberline Trail folder. And right now that has an idea of a campground for the pre-hike, a possible water source and a parking spot. But if I go back to my other waypoints, I can put in this Tilly Jane campground. I am able to add it to my Timberline um, folder. And then I will have a list of these waypoints or things that I will want to have available to me on this trip. Um, when I go to this folder, I can either share this whole folder with my crew that's going out to Oregon with me, or I can share an individual waypoint. And you're able to do that by clicking share and this link will populate and that will send, and then you're able to send that to a friend or whoever you're going hiking with. So this is how I would prepare behind my computer screen, uh, which is great, but I think one of the key uh, use cases for Onyx is using the product in the field. Having access to a map in your hand while you're offline is super critical. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna switch over to my phone and show you what that looks like on the mobile app. So as I'm doing that, um, one of the things that I think is really great about accessing the web and mobile experience is that all of the data that we just looked at and all of the things that we added to the map sync between my mobile and my, my app experience. So I added all those waypoints. I have access to my folder here with all my Timberline trail icons. Um, I can look and click on one of those and it'll zoom me into that water source. Again, the base maps are consistent between here and web. So you'll have access to an aerial base map, a topo base map, or a hybrid base map. What hybrid means real quick is it is our aerial imagery with things like contour lines layered on top. So you can still have a view of the ground and what is on the ground from an aerial perspective, but you'll also be able to, to evaluate things like the elevation via contour lines. So the data is synced, it's super cool. I find that to be a really nice feature. It's easy to plan on web. You bring that over to mobile. Um, you'll also see here on the top right-hand side, you have the weather icon. The weather information is um, for the area that you're looking at, which is really helpful. And as part of that, there's also forecast information for your upcoming trip. Um, but the main thing here is navigation and access to this data in the backcountry. So you'll see on the bottom, you've got your offline maps button here, which I'm gonna click on. And I'm going to 
um, download an offline map for access to this information when I am out of service. So all I'll do is click on offline maps, click on new map, and you'll see here that this big box or big rectangle outlines the area of the offline map that I'm about to download. So in this case, the entire loop isn't kind of covered in the square. So I would end up kind of creating two offline maps for this trip. But all you have to do is kind of orient the square on where you want the offline map to be. And I'll call this Timberline. I'll click done and I will hit save. And you'll see at the bottom of my screen or on my phone here, I it took less than 10 seconds to download that offline map. And that is now available for me when I am on airplane mode and out of service. Um, and I can show you kind of what that looks like. So I'm now offline. I've told my phone I'm offline. And as I zoom in outside of that offline map, you'll see that the base map gets a little blurry, which is not going to be helpful when you're, you're looking for those details. But when I go back over to the area that I have downloaded, which is that big green square, and I start to zoom in here, you'll see I have really detailed information all the way in on the contour lines, on where the trail is, and detail all those waypoints that I saved, all that other information that I saved while I was online is accessible for that area that you've downloaded, which is super valuable when you do not have access to service. Um, like I said, in this case, I would download two offline maps. So it covered the entire trail, but I just wanted to kind of show you what that, that workflow looked like there. Um, other things I wanted to touch on in the last piece here is the tracker experience. So the tracker is super valuable for when you are navigating and you're moving around in the back country. Um, right now I'm in Wheat Ridge. I am not on the Timberline Trail. I am in Colorado. So I'm going to go back to my current location. And if you can see here, go back in here, this red dot indicates that I am in tracking mode. Therefore, what this will do is as you're moving in the backcountry, oh, I did move around my house a little bit before this started. So good little demo. Um, my little, my blue line will start to follow me and follow where I'm moving, which is super valuable to know if you're still on the trail. In some cases, like Annie mentioned, your paper map might not be up to date. And maybe our, our trail data is a little outdated, but you'll know where you are in relationship to the trail or relationship to where you parked. And if you're foraging and you're in the forest, it gives you that confidence to know how to get back to where you started or where you need to go. So the tracking tool is critical for me. I don't wear a smartwatch, so I don't know how far I've gone, how what my pace is, what elevation I'm at, and all of that is included under that tracker experience. So um, super valuable to have that information at hand as you're navigating through the backcountry. So uh, once you're done for the day, you would just go ahead and either save that, or in my case, delete it, because I've gone 0.01 miles around my house this evening, which isn't something I need to mark. But that is an overview of both the mobile and the web experience and, and so, sort of how to start to scratch the surface on, on the Onyx features. And like one of the big things is you're not always play, planning a multi-night backpacking trip, but you do wanna find those trails in your community that you can start to get really comfortable on and, and know that you can be confident for those bigger trips. So I love to use the product to plan those even evening, evening in, endeavors and start to track how I'm doing on those evening endeavors. So I hope that was helpful. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and kick it back over to Becky when I share my screen again. Awesome. Thanks, Bergen. Uh, I feel like I always learn something new about the app every time I sit through one of these demos. It's so cool. There's just so so many incredible features um, to dive into in Onyx Backcountry. Okay, Q and A. Um, I feel like we did a lot of Q and A throughout the time, and since we're already over, we're gonna skip this. There's a few unanswered ones that we didn't get to, so I apologize if you have a have one in the rafters waiting. Um, but you can always reach out to to She Jumps and Women Who Hike um, or Onyx and try to get some of those questions answered. Uh, so thanks for sitting tight on those. Um, let's get into the giveaway because this is exciting. Um, we have a, a huge giveaway for uh, one very lucky winner. Um, 
we this comes with a Big Agnes sleep system, which includes a sleeping bag and pad. I personally love Big Agnes. One Deuter Air Contact Core Backpacking Pack. Deuter is my favorite, just like Nicole said for her as well. Um, they make incredibly well-built German engineered backpacks. That's awesome. Um, and then a $500 gift card from Merrill, which will get you a pair of shoes or two or three. So um, massive kudos to these three brands for really delivering on this giveaway. And then we have 10 Onyx hats to um, give away as well. So click on the QR code or the link in the chat. You do not need to purchase Onyx to enter to win, but you do need to have an account. So uh, sign up for the account, that way you'll be in the system and then click through in one of these two ways to get yourself entered to win. And then we will notify the winner in the coming days of who won this massive bounty of goods. We'll leave that up for one more minute, but the link should be in the chat. And then one last on the next slide, one last in case you missed it, the link to uh, get this super special deal on Onyx Backcountry. It's 30% off. This is as good as the deal ever gets. And a reminder that this deal ends at 8 a.m. Mountain Time tomorrow morning. So don't delay if you're if you've been inspired by this demo from Bergen and are ready to commit to approximately $20 investment into your navigation. Um, now's the time. This is as good of a deal as you're ever really going to get on Onyx Backcountry. So we wanted to offer that to this community for thank and as a thanks to, to you all for showing up. And then just a couple last notes here um, as we part ways this evening. Um, Bergen took us through a ton of features, but we have a, a lot more resources out there as you download, as you learn more, as you dig in. Um, we have a ton of tutorials on our website and on YouTube for things like how to, how to use offline maps, different layers, different tools. So um, even after this call is over, you have those resources on demand whenever you need them. Um, also more master classes will be coming. So stay tuned share with us your ideas of like what you want to learn more. We were talking earlier today, like maybe we need to break this into a series of classes because there's just so much to cover. So stay tuned. Um, we'll see. And then last but not least, uh, massive kudos to our customer support team. They are absolutely incredible. I'm always blown away at their level of service and knowledge. So any, there's, there's no such thing as a silly question. You can always email in help at onyxmaps.com um, and talk to someone to get your questions answered. Um, I feel like I have questions all the time that I reach out to our own customer service team and they're amazing. So definitely use that, um, have that at your fingertips. You can always email or call in. And with that, um, a little bit of a round of thank yous to, to everyone for coming tonight. Um, Bergen, thanks for that product demo. Once again, it was stellar. Thanks to Annie and Nicole for your expertise and for gathering this virtual community tonight. There was a few hundred of you on this call, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, massive kudos to She Jumps and Women Who Hike for building these communities and opportunities for all of us. Be sure to tune in to all of their real life community events and programming if you haven't already. It's really top notch. And then a couple just last little parting thoughts. Be safe out there, enjoy your route planning. Um, and remember that we all started somewhere. This can be a, a very intimidating sport, if you will, but you showed up tonight and that is a step to be proud of for sure. So lastly, don't forget to put your phone in the top of your pack and really enjoy the experience <laughs> out there. Sometimes I forget to do that myself, but that's actually the most important thing. Our natural spaces are really meant to be cherished. So get out there. Hopefully you learned a, a few good nuggets tonight and enjoy your backpacking trip. Thank you so much and have an awesome evening. Thank you.